those concepts that Bill presented and drill them down into Vancouver's context. What does it mean here for us locally? So basically, as you know, we have a reputation for being a sustainable city, but there is a schism between the consumption that we, all of us on average, um, sustain, which is far in a way exceeds what nature can support. So there, our ecological footprint is really on par with most of the high consuming societies around the world. So certainly Vancouver is not presenting a sustainable model of lifestyle. And so what uh, it looks like in terms of the sustainability gap, the difference between what our ecological ecological footprint our demand on nature services is and what could be provided every year through the world biocapacity on a per capita level. It's about, uh, we're in, in Vancouver, we're about in 60% overshoot, so at least 58% reduction in our ecological footprint to get to ecological carrying capacity. And you can see here that most of that is associated with energy and cropland. So I'm going to show you how our footprint breaks down. That energy, Bill mentioned in his talk, that we have now reached a point where about 90% of the food that we're eating is in some way representing a fossil fuel substitute. And it was a surprise in the time that I did the research, but slowly coming to terms with this, and many cities, many highly industrial cities around the world have the same pattern where food is the dominant component within our ecological footprint. So here I'm showing you the same data I just showed you in the bar graph that. This one is by land demand, land type. This is the same data reflected by the activity. So what's driving our food footprint is the combination of high energy intensity with the cropland and pasture area and fishing area. But a lot of it is energy. And then it's followed by transportation and buildings and consumables and to a very small percent waste. So what I want to do now is drill into each one of these pieces of the pie chart to help you understand what the ecological footprint by lifestyle activity looks like for an average Vancouverite. So this is that food. Remember half the footprint was food? So now we're just looking at that green wedge, half of the footprint. Here we're again looking at it from the perspective of the materials, the um, embodied energy, operating energy, and built area, which is not showing, and, and I'll explain what these all represent. The materials is the cropland. So of all the food we eat, about 75% of our food footprint is dedicated to cropland for producing the food that we're consuming. A much smaller percentage, 6%, is pasture land. So that's land just dedicated to the grazing of animals. A significant percentage is the embodied energy in uh, pesticides, fertilizers, um, that kind of thing, right? That's the oil that we're eating. A very small percent is in the transportation of our food, and that usually shocks people because we're used to thinking about food miles as a dominant driver in our choices. It is a dominant driver for fruits and vegetables. But in the entire food footprint of what we're eating, it's not, and uh, I'll explain that in just a minute. So hold this in your, in your head. This is exactly the same data reflected now in terms of food type. So here you see that half of that food footprint is dedicated to fish, meat, and eggs. And within this, almost 70%, 67% is only red meat consumption. So do you remember how cropland was such a big part of the food footprint? Well, what was surprising to me is that, remember pasture land was just a really small percentage? So half of that cropland is being used, diverted away from feeding humans directly, it's being used to feed our animals, which then we consume. So nine pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat, for say. So that's why red meat consumption is such a big part of our foot, food footprint. And then it's followed by um, dairy products, which are very high energy uh, intensity in dairy. Think about uh, pasteurization, cooling, that kind of thing. Transportation is not a big part of that. Uh, grains, nuts, legumes, fruits and vegetables, etc. So if you wanted to get to one planet living, what the data is telling us is that changes in our diet are actually a very powerful way to reduce the footprint. So choosing white meats or legumes even half the time that you're going to go for red meat would be a, an important step. And of course, uh, reducing the energy intensity in the food production system, remember that was a big piece, that would also be important, but the dietary choices would be more important. In terms of buildings, 
another part of that original footprint. Here, we see that it's the operating energy in our buildings that's the big driver. And the embodied energy in the, in the materials of the buildings, much lesser. So it doesn't mean that you know, the greenest building, I would argue, is the one that's already standing, so we should make, make use of what we've got. But definitely paying attention to the operating energy is very, very important. And I should just say, we know how to make more efficient buildings, but one of the things that uh, we lost sight of over the last 20 years, and a lot of the work I did with Metro Vancouver trying to stimulate awareness about green buildings, is that we have increased the energy efficiency of the mechanical systems in our buildings, but we have decreased the efficiency of the envelopes of those buildings. So for the last 20 years, all the modern high-rises that you're seeing in the downtown peninsula that are glass curtain wall perform no better from an energy consumption per square foot basis than the average single family home in Vancouver or buildings that were built 40 years ago. So, you know, that's a shocker for most of us because we've been so busy trying to promote green buildings. And it doesn't mean that we can't build green. We know how to do that. We're learning how to do it. It just means that the design elements that we're choosing, the architectural features of the buildings also have to be intended to conserve energy. Okay, now going to consumables and waste, we spend a lot of time thinking about waste in the region. We're striving for a zero waste policy, which means 70% of all the waste that we generate would be diverted from landfills or um, incineration and be recycled or composted. But if you look at the footprint, you see here that most of what's driving our demand for nature services is actually in the supply chain. So the waste piece, the green and the orange, that's the amount of energy, materials, and land dedicated to managing the wastes after we've consumed them. But the dark, the dark blue is the actual materials of the consumable products that we hold, the chair you're sitting in, the pen in your hand, the paper. The light blue and the dark red, that's the embodied materials in the supply chain that you're never actually gonna touch, but we're part of the production of the consumable products that we handle in our hands and the energy that went into manufacture of those products. And the pink is the energy associated with recycling of products. So in Vancouver, we do really, really well. We recycle over 50% of our consumables, but there's always an energy tag that goes with it. So the material itself gets repurposed, paper gets repulped and re reprocessed, but there's an energy component with that as well. So that's what the pink is. So the big message here is if we wanna reduce our ecological footprint, we're gonna have to consume less not recycle more. We're really gonna have to consume less. And also we're gonna have to address the way that these products are produced, right? Greening the supply chain. And here's transportation. So probably not a big surprise to most of us in Vancouver, very sensitive to this issue that the operation of motor vehicles is the dominant driver in the, in the transportation component of our footprint. It's, it's more than half. Um, commercial vehicles aren't so bad. Transit is really small. We could all be, we could double, triple, quadruple the energy intensity in the transit system and we'd have no problems with that. Uh, air travel is significant and the embodied energy in our vehicles is significant. So not only would we need to get out of our cars, we'd also have to reduce the amount of cars that we own to get away from that embodied energy in the fleet, as well as think a lot about how much air travel we do. So if you take, the data that I've just presented, the top five actions that each of us could take to reduce our footprint to try to get down to one planet living, which is this 1.7 global hectares per capita equivalent to the amount that the global um, biocapacity can produce on an annual basis, so we'd be in equilibrium with nature's capacity. Top things we could do, make most of our trips by walking, cycling, and transit. Very, very few by motor vehicles, and preferably by non-emission <laughs> vehicles, so electric or uh, if you can find zero emission, if you can truly find zero emission <laughs> vehicles. Reducing food waste post-purchase by 50%. So in Vancouver, we have a significantly high food waste ratio. So that means the food that's spoiling in your fridge, uh, re retail produce that's at end of life and, and simply gets discarded. And reducing meat consumption by 50%. So you don't have to be vegan, although that would really help. But you know, just reducing it by 50% can help us get a long way. Improving energy efficiency in our buildings by at least 40%. We, we know how to do it. 
We have the capability, but we have to implement the design solutions to make it happen. And I think the city of Vancouver should be recognized for its leadership around um, producing zero emission buildings by 2020 or trying to introduce those bylaws. And then reducing paper consumption. And that's a bit of a, 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 tr a tricky one because the footprint really biases towards the land base. So it's not to say that using computer gadgets is better than paper. It just means that I don't have all the data for the hazardous materials, those, those finite resources that Bill mentioned that are also in decline and depletion. So, you know, don't just rely on recycling paper, try not to use paper, and try not to use other gadgets as well. And if you do, make them last as long as you can. So even if we did all of this, this is what we as individuals can do to get what, to one planet living, but I hate to say it, we're still not gonna get there. And uh, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, some, of the, some of the reasons why we won't get there. So One Planet Living for us looks like repurposing and fixing our, and sharing our belongings, sh sharing the economy, avoiding consumption of paper, red meat and bottled beverages, um, roads, transfer, uh, roads, roofs, walls, everything would be in agricultural production. Most of our trips would be by walking, cycling and transit. Any vehicles we do use would be zero emissions. And most people would not fly, very few would own cars, and buildings would be energy efficient and also zero emission as well. Okay, that's one planet living for Vancouver. But we do, as Bill mentioned, live in an economy that doesn't support this at all. So I wanted to share with you some of these paradoxes of sustainability. So the first one is the paradox of efficiency. The next one's the paradox of growth. And the last one's the paradox of information. And hopefully as I go through this, it'll stimulate some questions that we can then get into in terms of what are the challenges we face. So paradox, um, most of you are probably aware, it's a statement that conflicts or confounds common sense, but nevertheless is true. So the first one is the paradox of efficiency. So you know we, we think that technological innovation is going to enable us to uh, use resources more efficiently, and that's a good thing because we can do more with less. But the paradox, so here's your technological innovation, but the paradox is the rebound effect, which as uh, Jevons articulated in 1856, so again, no new knowledge here, um, it is the, as we, um, we can serve resources for a short period of time through efficiency benefits, but then as prices drop, the access to those resources increases to a broader spectrum of people and demand ultimately ends up going up again. We find new opportunities to use these cheaper resources, so in the end, we use more. So here, you know, we became more efficient in our use of lighting, cost goes down, but we're simultaneously electrifying the planet. And what we do with those savings is typically in a growth economy, we're encouraged to spend, right? So we're saving money on our electricity bill, but now we can fly to Hawaii or Mexico or have another trip or buy another gadget. And so at the end of the day, we're still consuming as much or more than ever before. The other one, paradox of growth, which I think Bill did a much better job than I will of explaining. But here's the assumption is that growth is synonymous with good. So, you know, the phrase, a rising tide lifts all boats. So uh, one of the challenges, though, is that it only really lifts some boats, right? We live in a world where the bottom billion are still the bottom billion. They might as well be anchored to the seafloor as the tide rises above their heads and probably will with sea level rise. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh when I say that. Um, <laughs> sorry. I don't think it's funny. It's just, it's, it is just so ironic that we, a very small group of the, of the world's population, have created so many hazardous problems for so many other people on the planet. And so we have this paradox where we are conditioned to believe that wealth should be created, right? You are doing good if you're creating jobs, stimulating the economy, and we shouldn't be redistributing, giving people handouts. Let's just all get in there and work for it. And what this overlooks is uh, the phenomenon of allometric growth, of the Pareto Law, which states that some individuals have a certain advantage that they can, they can exercise that gives them a greater share in consumption than their representative proportion. Okay? The equivalent is the small dog with the big bone. Right? If I am competitive and I have advantage in the market, for every round of transactions, I will gain more and accumulate more to myself. So we end up in a situation where we have grown, the economy has grown 20-fold uh, while the population has only grown fourfold in the last century. 
So there's $5 more per person, even with this incredible population explosion, there's more money circulating amongst all of us than ever before. Or is it? No, right? All of the money, not all of the money, but most of that money is circulating between the hands of a very small few with Allometric or Pareto Advantage. So about, you end up with a situation where 20% of the global population is consuming 80% of the world's resources. That also includes us in Vancouver. And 80% of the world is living off the remaining 20% and less. So economic growth is really just driving this or exacerbating this inequitable distribution of resources. And finally, the paradox of information. So David Orr would argue that we may actually be losing the intelligence we need to live equitably and sustainably on the planet. So our minds are filled with more information now than ever before. Apparently there's more new information in a Sunday issue of the Times, New York Times, than a person ever encountered during their entire life at the turn of the last century. So Bill's example too, you could live your whole life and nothing new would happen. Today it's happening every second, it's accelerating. And yet we're not necessarily getting any wiser. We're certainly not exercising the kind of intelligence we would need to increase our social caring capability to look out for one another in a collaborative environment, in a sharing economy. And so I think this is uh, the piece that we need to get back to is what is information, what is knowledge around living sustainably. And so finally, uh, you've, you've probably heard Bill mention in past presentations about this factor five. We do know how to get here. But do we have the political will? Do we have the ability to mobilize ourselves to engage and move past these paradoxes, past these challenges, to achieve an 80% reduction, factor five reduction, in our energy material throughput? Remember I said in Vancouver we're at about 60? Okay, so we might be doing better than average, but if we included the national consumption of the military, the treasury, and all those other things that are happening outside the city of Vancouver that enable us to live good lives as Canadians, our footprint would be even bigger. So we are really in that 60 to 80% factor four, factor five reduction. And so the argument is that to live sustainably, what we need is a shrink and share strategy where we, the high consumers, need to reduce our consumption and share both within our city and across the world with others so that they can live more, more equitable lives. And this is really that fundamental pattern of degrowth that we're talking about coupled with social justice. So that's what it looks like at the local level, and that's why I think we need degrowth if we want one planet living in Vancouver. Thank you. <laughs>